International Association of Home Staging Professionals. So thank you all for tuning in. The show is a weekly show where we have a conversation about home staging, business success, the industry, other topics as well that have nothing to do with home staging. And, um, and we appreciate everybody for tuning in. And if you could share this as you're watching it, share it to your post or to your uh, profile that helps us reach more people. And, um, uh, and I, this we're into show 77, if you can believe it, 77. So uh, today we've got a great show for you. We have uh, two guests we'll be interviewing after I do basic announcements. First one is Robbie Huthi Singh, and he'll be able to correct me if I'm saying his last name wrong. But he's one of our keynote speakers for our conference, um, IHOSP Conference 2020 in Denver. We'll learn more about him and what he's going to be sharing on. And then we also have Edie Keach he'll be sharing, and uh, she has a new company she's going to talk about blueprint for success what that's all about um the seattle lead workshop and her role in ihosp and so forth and just kind of get caught up with everything edie's doing so excited for that um of course basic announcements first i want to talk about our conference of course it's coming up in denver september 25th 26th and 27th and then the 28th and 29th is the advanced stager training that's for six figure and above stagers six figure and above stagers you know, if you're not at six figures yet and you want to come, then you need to come to one of these training workshops. This is the lead your market workshop that are happening all over the uh, U.S. and even Canada. We want to get these scheduled and you can see the topics that are being covered. And this is to help anybody at any business level to um, understand how to do things better, more efficiently um, under pricing and profitability, your business logistics and operations. How do you scale? How do you grow your team building and delegating? There's a point um, as a stager where you can't do everything yourself. So you have a choice to make. You either stay uh, where you are or you start adding team members. And how do you do that? And how do you know what roles they should be in? Your marketing, social media, and apps, it's always evolving. And then finances, planning and positioning yourself for success because we are self-employed. There's ways that we can actually finance our own expansion and growth. And there's also, we'll talk about how to possibly get funding to help you expand because that's one of the number one challenges a stager has and growing is the financial piece, being able to get the capital. So these are happening all over. And you can go to leadyourmarketworkshop.com. And LEAD stands for Learn, Elevate, Analyze, and Dominate. And that's what we want for everybody. And this is open to any stage. You don't have to belong to an association. You don't even have to have taken a class to get started. We just want to help you be successful. And that's our mission um, for IHOSP is to help um, people that are in the industry. If you want to be successful, we want to show you how to make that happen. Hey, everybody. So look up Lead Your Market Workshop. Lead Your Market Workshop. I don't know if I can type this in here. Lead Your. Okay, no, it's not going to work. I've got fingers. I'm elevated up here with my laptop. Um, LeadYourMarketWorkshop.com. All right, pen picking here. All right, so that's going to show up on the screen. So check that out. And, and please, if you're interested, like um, we're teaching in Boston April 9th, I'll be flying to teach the master's course which is a five day course. One of those days we're actually gonna take and do the workshop. And so those people in the Boston, Rhode Island, yeah, that whole surrounding area, um, Maine, please register so we actually can tell our sponsors and the other speakers how many people to expect. So um, anyway, we're very excited for our conference. Tickets are on sale, ihospconexpo.com. And of course the advanced stager training will be part of that. So as part of that, these are our keynote speakers. You can see Robbie there on the right. He will be part of our uh, cultural diversity expert designation that we'll be giving at conference. And those of you that have come to an IHOS conference in the past know that in addition to all the fabulous vendor expo with all the vendors that are coming on board um, and excited to see us again, the largest expo for home staging industry event and um, the uh, education we bring with our regular speakers that are featured on stage in our breakout sessions, tons of education for beginner, intermediate and advanced. We also give credentials. And so last year we did the investor staging consultant designation. And by the way, that's been released now for anybody to be able to attend via webinar that just came out this week. So if you missed that at the conference and you want to get trained to work with investors, you can register for that investor staging consultant. Um, you can go to ihosp.com and learn more about that. So this year we're doing the cultural diversity experts, so IHOSP CDE. So Ravi will be speaking as part of that session and we're excited to have him there. Then of course we have um, Johnny Fowler, who's our marketing keynote. And uh, we heard from him, um, we heard from him on our 
chapter or membership call, I should say. And so we'll get him on one of these sessions as well because he's super knowledgeable. And then Chris Widener, very excited about him being our business keynote, best selling author of 20 different books. 21st book is being released. Uh, so we've got a great lineup. We bring you three for the price of one. Nobody brings you more education than IHOSP. So get your tickets. All right. Of course, we have Portugal coming up. Um, this is our, where is there no date on here? Anyway, May 23rd is our IHOSP Europe conference. And so I do want to say, um, uh, share concern for everybody over in Europe. Uh, I talked to or messaged Sonia Radovinovich, who's our IHOSP Europe president yesterday and um they're on lockdown in italy i mean 68 million people i believe on a lockdown they're not allowed to leave their houses she can go get food but they have to put masks and gloves on and so um you know if you know people over in that country that part of the world just you know say some prayers for them because it's you know not a good situation and um and they can't work that's the big thing is they can't earn any money so uh, we fully support you know safety and health and so forth and wherever you live, if the virus hasn't hit where you are, you take precautions, don't go panicking. And I couldn't even get any toilet paper. Here in Denver, we only have like six cases. The shelves are cleaned out, it's ridiculous. It's not, um, I understand some people's concern about having to be on lockdown, but um, anyway, so just say some good thoughts to conference at this point, we are gonna have it. Um, at this point, we haven't made any decisions to cancel or do anything. It is at the end of May. So um, the health people are saying by then, actually by April sometime, that the uh, virus hopefully should stop spreading because that's when the flu season and so forth is over. So we'll take it sort of a, you know, a glance at a time. But the location in Lisbon is beautiful. Um, airfare right now, super inexpensive. <laughs> I'm going to get my ticket uh, probably this week to fly over and do get insurance on your flight just in case something happens. But we're really looking forward to bringing a lot of great education to you in Europe as well. And some key partners will be there as well um, that we're very excited about sharing uh, with all the people in Europe. Today is Wednesday, stage your Wednesday, hashtag stage your Wednesday, hashtag raise the standard. So make sure to use those today when you're posting on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Um, I interviewed Paloma Harrington Griffin last week. And so she, we are launching in Brazil um, on, um, I should know this. This I just think it's this week. So very excited for that. So those of you that are watching, if you're from Brazil or that part of the country, Latin America, and so forth, you want to learn more, uh, please reach out to us. You can email me at Jenny at ihoff.com. Put this in here, um, and we have a lot on social media being announced about the the Brazil launch. Paloma speaks Portuguese, and so it, everything will be in their language. So we're translating things on our sites. Uh, we will have an association launched in Brazil in conjunction with IHOSP and also start doing some education there. So uh, we'll be teaching staging courses there and also in France. So right now we're working on translating our course into French. Hayden Yates is helping us with that. And um, we'll be working with, with Verena Mumford to teach over in France. So um, again, IHOSP is on the grow and helping influence other staging growth areas. And it's our pleasure to do that. That's our mission. So is to help grow the industry. And so I think that is pretty much everything I have for announcements. Um, so again, thank you everybody for tuning in. Hey, Karen, hey, Yolanda, hey, Sandy, hey, Jennifer. Um, go ahead and share the segment out so it helps us reach more people. We really appreciate that. And so I'm gonna bring on the first guest. So Rob, it'll show a countdown. There he is. Good morning. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. You're such a global organization. It could be anywhere, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's just a good, good, good uh, day. Good, good March 11th or could be even later. So tell people who you are. So my name is Ravi. I'm a global keynote speaker. I spend about 200 to 250 days a year traveling. Uh, and so it's most of it's global. I've got projects uh, in Europe and in Asia and in South America, where, where I currently am. And uh, but live mostly outside of Washington, D.C. in the U.S. And I serve uh, my businesses, my audiences in three different capacities. Uh, one is a keynote speaker. 
um, for conferences just like IHOSP and, and uh, industries that are dealing with diversity and globalization and artificial intelligence and the impact that has on all of our businesses as well as education. Um, but I also serve as a cultural diplomat for the U.S. Department of State, where I create um, actually songwriting programs around mm -hmm. the world that bring together people from traditionally opposed cultures and religions through music. And that's because my background is as a musician and a songwriter. And back in the late 90s, I was the guitar player of the band Hanson. And right. We were top selling that, band. Um, yeah. Okay. Come awesome. give us some lyrics. <laughs> We'll get a guitar on the stage and we'll see what happens, right? <laughs> That'd be fun. <laughs> but yeah. um, so it really, that's sort of uh, the collection of what I do, but it's all focused really on uniting people that really uh, come from different parts of, not only different parts of the globe, but different generations as well. It's really about united cultures and generations. Which is awesome. I think, well, what a great um, role. Now, did you sort of, create this because you were interested in it? Because I don't think I've known anyone else that really does what you do. Yeah, you know, I call myself a cultural catalyst. I might be the only one in the world with that title. I don't know. But it is sort of a evolution of seeing opportunities. And, you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot with my audiences is developing the ability to pivot. Uh, to accept change, not only accept change, but embrace change. And the way that you deal with change is not by changing everything, but by simply pivoting, by using the experiences and resources that you have in order to head in a new direction. And I've always done that through music. And then I became a pilot and worked a lot in the aviation industry. And now as a keynote speaker and cultural diplomat, it's a, uh, it's a culmination and an evolution of experiences that um, have given me this opportunity to try to take some of my experiences and influence some other people and help them out uh, to achieve their dreams, their goals and build their businesses. And I like that word pivot. So you have, um, he has an Instagram page. So I go, I encourage all you all to follow. So it's Robbie Speaks and um, you have a minute to pivot. So you do this little yeah. minute inspirational thing every day. So it's, it's really wonderful. And I love that word pivot because just like you said, when people, things aren't going right or, um, you know, the world changes, our business changes. And if we don't, if we stay just the course and, and meanwhile, the industry is kind of moving over here, we're going to we're going to fall by the wayside. So I like that it's not this huge, like 180 degree or 90 degree thing. It's just a pivot it could be a slight right. adjustment. Right. And, you know, I think that's, you know, when people look at my career, uh, you know, as different parts, as a musician, as a pilot, as a cultural diplomat, it seems very disconnected. But when I take you through the track, the trajectory of it, as I will in the keynote, because that's sort of the, the narrative, uh, you see how these pivots are made. And the key to being able to pivot successfully is to find your pivot point. That's what a pivot is, right? It's on a point. So you have to really determine what that is for your business in order to do that. And and just, if I may, uh, all my social media is at Ravi Unites, not Ravi Speaks. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Ravi Unites. It's okay. I'll put that just down. So, you can find, so everybody can find it. It's all at Ravi Unites. And yeah, the Minute to Pivot series is something new because uh, if we take one minute a day to really figure out where we want to go and how we can use our existing uh, circumstances to help us get there, then it is much less daunting than the idea of, well, how do I change or how do I evolve? Well, I think also um, what you just said is really critical, identifying the, the point and then pivoting towards it. So mm. the decision of, of knowing where you're going, that happens first. And then you make the adjustment versus I think a lot of people just sort of start, you know, moving. I'll try this. I'll try that. They don't really have a focus. So I think that's super important. Yeah, and at the same time, that's right. You can throw things up against the wall and see what sticks, or you can actually have an overarching vision and goal for what you're trying to achieve. And when you do that, when you have a vision, this is what I, I tell students a lot. When I, when I go lecture at colleges and universities, I talk a lot about uh, the importance of having vision because the reality is all the opportunities in the world are around us all the time. They're there. They're there right now around us. But unless you have a vision and a goal and an understanding of where you want to go, you don't recognize those opportunities. But once you have that vision, all of a sudden, those opportunities start to be, start to appear. Right. And so and that's great because our, our um, conference theme is vision for success because it's the year 2020 vision for success, exactly. focus, clarity, future. And uh, so because it's the year 2020, we did the whole logo around that. Then I realized that in Europe, well, other parts of the world, 2020 vision doesn't mean anything, but zero, zero does. So the logo still yeah. works in Europe, <laughs> yeah. other parts. So that's, yeah, you have to have definitely a vision. Um, so let's talk about, you know, you, um, you said you were like a cultural diplomat. So in some of the pictures you were with like Colin Powell. So what did you yeah. do in that role? 
Well, that was actually specifically we were both keynoting at the same conference. And so we talked a little bit about various different things about the future of education, about the future of governments, because also my background, family background is the first family of India. My great uncle was Jawaharlal Nehru, the first prime minister of India and the architect of the world's largest democracy. And Indira Gandhi is my cousin. Rajiv Gandhi is my cousin. So I come from a political family, although my father pivoted and became a businessman on Wall Street. So while I come from a political family, I was actually raised by a Wall Street family. And then I pivoted and found rock and roll because I wanted to be Angus Young of ACDC, wound up in Hanson. You're much more handsome than he is, by the way. <laughs> watch ACDC. That guy's just so weird. I mean, he's, you know, he's, he's amazing, but he's just like some of the stuff he does. It's just, my husband's a big oh, fan. No, it's, it's, but, you know, so it's really, um, uh, as a cultural diplomat, it's really uh, about bringing people together because we are, we've been in a, a, a transition to globalization. And as we deal with technology and artificial intelligence, I believe that it is the humanity that is going to become more and more important. And this speaks directly to the idea of home staging, because this is about creating the environments in which the new generations who are more global, who are more multicultural, who deal with more diversity, their, their degrees of, of comfort is just different. Um, their sense of nostalgia is different. So the things that motivate them to make purchases, their their vision for the future, their their ideas about investing in their future are all different. And so when we look at the millennial generation and then of course Gen Z coming up right after them, we look at what their buying habits are, what their global views are, that really influences the way that we have to market to them. And so as a cultural diplomat, it's not much different. I mean, honestly, what am I marketing as a cultural diplomat? World peace. That's what I want to see. I want to see uh, people working towards that. And I think that when we look at humanity and when we look at the influence that technology is having with humanity, we can see already from the millennial generation that there is more interest in face-to-face -face contact. There is more interest in doing things that are social and prioritizing work less. So all of this really starts to become very relevant in terms of how we market and attract the new generation. Right, and I feel like the more that people can understand other cultures, the less people have to fear or be concerned about, the more, more that we can understand other people, the more that helps bring people together. And, and I, I think the, you know, the goal of world peace, I think all of us would like to not have any conflict in, in the world. And I think that comes with people understanding and getting rid of biases. And so as a stager going into a property, there's been times, you know, like um, I, I came from Sacramento, so that wasn't very culturally diverse, honestly. And a lot of the uh, Russians escaping religious persecution, they end up landing there. I lived in the Bay Area. I was born in Santa Cruz. And so I lived um, in San Francisco. That's much more diverse, that whole region. Yeah. Then we moved out here. Denver, the city, has some some diversity, but you know, like the high school football team was, um, you know, pretty much one man of color, and um, you, you know, just was not anything diverse. And so, but as over time, we're seeing more and more people. They're coming from different cultures, different parts of the world, and so we can't insulate ourselves and think like, oh, I have to do business like I've always done. And the last thing I want when I walk into someone's home is to not understand something that I see or their customs and then somehow offend them right. by going through the process with them. So um, I think, you know, realtors are taught, there's a whole book, um, something bow and shake hands, kiss, bow and shake hands. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of realtors are, you know, encouraged to read that. I've never read the book. I probably should before the conference. It might be a good thing to take a look at. Um, but we have to understand the cultures about when we're engaging with somebody, picking up on some of the signs and, um, right. Yeah. Well, you're, you're talking a lot about something that I talk about with educators a lot, which is what I believe the most important skill, in addition to being able to pivot, with the most important uh, skill of the future is cultural competence. And with cultural competence, it means not just understanding and educating yourself on other people's culture so you can relate to them, but it's also about understanding your own culture, which is really important because if we understand our own culture, uh, which is our beliefs, our behaviors, and our values, ultimately, that's the what I believe are the three things that make up our culture, that also helps us identify our own implicit biases. 
And anytime you're dealing with people that are maybe a little different or have a different background than you or than what you're used to, especially if you've grown up in a not very diverse community, your implicit biases are just there. That's part of human nature. It's nothing to be ashamed of, nothing to be embarrassed about. But to be successful in a global world, we have to be able to identify our implicit biases to recognize them so that we can account for them when we deal with other people. It's not about eliminating them, but it's about understanding them and accounting for them. Right. Right. Because we, you know, um, we would never want to be accused of not taking a client because of, um, you know, being biased or racist or whatever it is. And so being able right. to, I think it just comes with the understanding. I remember, you know, and it's all, as you said, it's the generation. So my grandfather I'll use this example. He was um, a pr professor at Stanford, very intelligent man, was Polish, um, got, you know, ridiculed a lot. I remember my younger sister, when she was in grade school, they did a Polak jokes. Mm -hmm. The teacher sent home Polak jokes and yes. my grandfather happened to be visiting. <laughs> he went into the, he went into the school and he said, Copernicus, Chopin, you know, they said they're very intelligent. This is insulting. And the teacher was like, right. she just thought it was a joke. And then when I was in high school, I went to a, um, I was on a dance team and we would hang out with the basketball guy. So I went to a formal with this guy named Woody Jones, who was a black guy. And so I remember sending a picture to my grandfather and he writes back, she's been tainted by black blood. I'm like, oh my God, Baba, that's so <laughs> racist. And Cause I didn't feel that way at all. So yeah. from that generation, my parents weren't, and then, you know, we're not, but it's just that whole cultural thing, you know, Absolutely. life evolves and you have to um, evolve with it. Otherwise you, you're just going to have these thought processes and thoughts that aren't, current and won't allow right. you to be inclusive. Well, these things can become, you know, very divisive, you know, especially in a global world. And, and we are so divided, you know, as a country and as a world. I mean, you know, when you look at what's going on, not just politically in America, but here we're, you're talking about you're a global organization. So when you look about look at the uh, social unrest that's going on here in Chile or the social unrest that's going on in France or Hong Kong or Iran, Iraq, you name it. Um, there is a lot of uh, divide that there are with people. And the real opportunity, I think, and what, what I love about your conference and about your industry is that the home is the place where everybody comes together. It is so, so important. And it is going to become more and more important. The more divided that we are and the more separated we are, it's going to come full circle to where those younger generations are going to say, you know what, the home is not just where I want to bring my multicultural friends to uh, engage and have a meal, uh, but, you know, this is where people are going to work from as well. Uh, the home office is going to become even bigger and bigger. Remote um, working, you know, remotely is becoming bigger and bigger. So the home is taking on a bigger role in people's lives than it did in the previous generation where people went to work for 8, 10, 12 hours a day. Yeah, and that's, you know, and that's interesting because the whole building industry has to pivot with the evolution as well. So the home offices, they went from having these massive, like master bedrooms and so forth. And then they had, um, they kind of went to having shrinking the private spaces and making the common spaces bigger right. and more, more open. Um, right. But most builders are going to have to have one, if not two office spaces or places where people can work. Because you're right, people do want to work. That's what I do. I work from home. I could, I could work from literally anywhere yeah. you know, as long as I have the cloud, right, the, for my right. data. So Right. And you're right, the, the Z generation or the Gen Z, they call them the, um, the centennials, I, I generation that keeps seeing these different names. They said that they're going to be more nomadic, that they don't, they're not going to necessarily plant roots like, um, you know, some people that have lived in my house for 40 years. That's not going to be this generation. And they want to change right. the world. They want to have a global right. influence. And of course, they've been plugged in their whole life. So technology is just part of their life. And um, so you're right. I hadn't really thought about it. Yeah, technology yeah. has to be integrated into the home, just like technology is integrated into their bodies. You know, as right. I would say, you know, the, I mean, the cell phone is just an extension of their hands in the younger generations, right? I mean, they're not. <laughs> and one of the things that I say, and I'll probably say it at your conference, is we think these kids are looking at the phones, but they're not. They're looking through the phones because the world is on the other side. And that's what the windows of the home of tomorrow are going to be, is not just looking at the outdoors, but is using technology to bring the world into your home. Like, like chills it's really very cool yeah because it's true when they're at their they're looking at their phones it's even i mean i've seen people at an event and instead of watching whatever's unfolding it could be a race or whatever it is instead of watching it live they're recording it on their phone so that they're watching it through the screen so they can so they miss this whole experience out here because they're looking at it and if their phones they can maybe save it for later i don't know it's just right. interesting yeah and i've done that with 
graduations and stuff, you want to capture the moment. So I'm, I'm w watching through a camera or a cell phone versus seeing it here. It's, the, it's kind of funny, you know, it's like if you watch a concert and you're filming the whole thing, and I'm guilty of this too, or, or that a too. tennis match, say, you might as well just stay home and watch it on TV. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's true. Yeah. I mean, and so you, so I'm, I'm really excited to have you um, coming to our conference and speaking. Um, we haven't had a keynote do part of the, comp, the um, education piece before, but I thought this was perfect. And I had wanted to do the cultural thing the last year or so was kind of on my, my heart to do that. And um, I think the timing is definitely right based on what's going on in the, in the world. And so yeah. where can people, people can find you at RobbieUnites.com, his website. Um, then the Instagram is Robbie Unites. Yep, and yeah. Twitter's Robbie and then Twitter, Unites, everything. Facebook, Ravi Unites, everything. Yeah, Ravi go follow Unites. him on, follow him on Instagram because he has his, he has a video he puts out every every morning. So I followed him, um, and I it's always a great inspiration. And so, what does your family think about your um, your your like latest evolution? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know it's interesting because um, having grown up in a Wall Street family and having. When I say that, I mean, I have two older brothers that are also investment bankers. It was a real departure for me to go on my own. And I think really hard for my dad to accept. But at the same time, I know he admired it because he had done the same thing with his with his dad right. and his family. So I think he I think my family was really concerned about my ambitions as a as a teenager wanting to just pursue a life of rock and roll. But the bottom line is I did what I think everybody needs to do in life to be successful, which is just stay focused, work hard, keep your standards high. And, um, you know, always, always shoot to be the best that, that you really can be. Um, and I've always done that and, and always continue to do that. And I think if you do that in, in life, in school, in work, uh, that's part of what it means to be a successful human being. So I, I think my parents are proud. Well, sure. And you also followed your passion, which a lot of people are not able to do. They fall into a career. So I'm not saying that your brothers don't enjoy what they do, but is it really their passion? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You're, you're being able to, to take your passion for bringing people together and sharing and educating and music, being able to combine it all together and create this this um, role for yourself. That's really this cultural, you know, what do you call cultural catalyst? I love that. That yeah. um, is, is super important. So you followed your passion and and that's a lot when people in the, that kind of circles back to home staging. A lot of us had careers before. Uh, I was in environmental consulting. People have, you know, we have teachers, nurses, doctors, architects. I mean, there's all sorts of background um, people that come into staging, and then people finally feel like I follow. I'm finding my passion because I love to be creative. I love helping people. So I think that's, I think that's really important. And and I'm sure your parents are very proud. Yeah, and we, you know, we all. It's not necessarily one passion either, and your passions evolve. I mean, passion. My passion growing up was music, and I was very lucky to achieve a lot of my dreams in the music industry at a fairly early age. But one of the things that I discovered as a touring musician um, was that I could go see the world. I discovered the world, and then that became my passion: traveling and right. being a global citizen. That's really my passion. I mean, you know, even from a home standpoint, I have homes on on three different continents. I believe in. Being a global citizen, it's what excites me and what's my, what is my passion today. That's exciting. So I, we're, we'll have you on again um, further, like later this summer. We got another interview with you. and uh, But make sure everybody to get your tickets to the conference because Robbie's one of our excellent keynote speakers. And just from what you shared, this little 15, 20 minute nugget, um, we know you're, we're going to be hearing a lot of really great tidbits, wisdom, nuggets that we could take with us and so i'm excited to have you joining us have you been to denver before i have you know i was in denver just um just uh within the last six months i think uh actually at the same convention center uh, oh gaylord? The gaylord yeah so um uh, I'm, I'm familiar with it and looking forward to being back and by the way you know as long as my schedule permits and, and i hope it will uh i always love to hang out with my audiences so you know we'll We'll hang out at the bar afterwards and talk about these concepts and ideas beyond the, the keynote itself, because that's also how I learn. I learn by listening to my audiences and I want to learn from all of you. Well, yeah, and we, and we want you to hang out. And actually, so this year we're doing, we always have an awards dinner. And so it's uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So we usually we're doing the awards dinner on the first night of the full. So it'd be like Saturday night. And it just right. makes a really long day, you know? So um, what I decided this year is to put the awards dinner as more of a celebration, a closing event. And it's a great Gatsby theme. So you got to bring your, you got to, you know, costumes are optional. People will dress up, but it's the, it's the roaring 2020s. 
um, uh -huh. Great Gatsby Gala, and we're going to have a speakeasy in there. So you definitely um, are welcome to join us for that. I know Chris is going to be there, and I believe Johnny as well. So we'll make uh -huh. sure to have a, a spot for you, and um, and then yeah, that'll be yeah. fun because that'll be let our hair down and really be able to engage. So yeah, that's really that's for me. That's a, that's a huge part of it is making sure that the conversation continues because that's how we produce results. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being with us. And um, everybody, hopefully you enjoyed meeting Ravi. And tell me how you say your last name. You actually said it very well at the intro. Uh, um, it, it's Hutti Singh. Oh, so Hutti Singh. Yeah. Okay. The H is silent. It's like Kevin Tain. His H is silent too. So I remember that. Okay. Well, good. All right. Thank you so much for being with us. Say goodbye to All Ravi, right. everybody. See you soon. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So Edie, I'm going to bring you in. You can. Thanks, Robbie. Hey, Edie. Hey, how are you, Jenny? Good. I had to mute you there for a second because I was getting feedback. You look good with your fuchsia. I put my fuchsia on in honor of you, but yours is more purpley fuchsia. Love it. Yeah. Well, it's gray here, so we try to wear bright colors. <laughs> yeah, and our glasses. See our purple glasses? <laughs> yes. We could be Where'd you get your glasses? Are they Zalul? Uh, I don't even know. I got these. Melissa Moore was wearing these fun, like kind of cat eye glasses. Oh, oh you know, years yeah. ago, so I ordered a bunch of them they, from Zulu. Lulu. They're just readers. Guinness. What's that? They're Lulu Guinness. Lulu Guinness. I like them. They're pretty. Well, good morning, or yes, good morning where you are, and um, tell everybody who you are. I am Edie Keach. I live in the greater Seattle area, which right now is very quiet, and. Um, Formerly, I had a full-service home staging business called um, Staging Puget Sound, which I ran for 10 years. And in September, I sold my staging business to another stager, inventory, and all. And now I am starting a, um, an analyst and um, advising business. And that company is called Blueprint for Staging. Was blueprint for staging, not blueprint for success. Yeah, I said it wrong. It's blueprint for blueprint for staging. Oh, blueprint. What? So say it again. Blueprint and then the numeral four staging. Okay, blueprint for staging. So I had it wrong. Blueprint for staging, and you're and that's it's total meaning behind because obviously it's not just you came up with that name, whatever. Because you have a background. Edie um, is an architect. Yes. Correct. Yes. So um, my first career of so far, this new one will be my fifth. Uh, <laughs> my first career uh, was a, as an architect, and then I was uh, an educator, and I ran a um, medical practice, and um, then I was a full-service home stager, and now I'm an analyst and an advisor. So... Um, I just have a few qualifications. Yeah, so I have a background in a lot of stuff. Um, I'm one of those people that's both equal left brain and right brain. So I love the creative side and my, my careers tend to pendulum swing. So the first one was creative and the second one was more analytic and the third one was creative. So now I'm going back to the analytic. Um, and what I do is advise home staging companies, um, to all of those business related things that most people that are really creative kind of put on the back shelf, you know, your, your mission, your vision, um, all of the paperwork that you need to have in place, the employee handbook, um, job descriptions, company philosophy, procedure manuals, all of those things are what I help each company develop. Um, I have a website that depicts all of the process and um, pricing is individual depending on what each person needs. So if folks are interested, they just have to go to my website or email me. And the email is really hard. It's Edie at Blueprint for Staging. Um, and I've been working with a few um, different IHOSP companies for the past few months. Um, it's a very interesting process because each client is totally unique. 
So although I'm selling business systemization, you can only systemize to a certain point and then you have to adapt for the needs of each individual. So it's really fun. Awesome. It's really, yeah. fun, really challenging. Well, it's also depending on the, the person who you're working with, if they're, you know, you can set systems up, but if people don't use them, you know what I'm saying? Then they're useless. So you have to set things up that are going to, you know, well, part of it is kind of bringing people kicking and screaming into having to be organized. <laughs> yes. But then also making sure that they're actually going to use whatever it is. And so um, I think June Carter, when she was talking about organizing and coaching, and she's so um, like, I might file things alphabetically because that makes sense for me. And then other people might file things based on, you know, other, other methods. But as long as it's getting, you're getting what you need done, the, it's not just one right way to do it. And so you're right. able to understand how they need to have things done and then create a, a system that works for them. Yes. And the, what most people want me to start with an employee handbook and procedure manual because that gets everybody on the same page. They learn they need to actually have group meetings and all talk about this together and that's one of the biggest problems that they've been having, not having that communication, not being able to have a format that they can follow. Um, one of the things that I developed um, for all things, even when I was doing home staging, was I came up with core values of home staging. So a mission statement and a vision are for the homeowner. Core values guide everyone. So it guides the business owner, it guides employees, and you share it with your clients, with the realtors, with the homeowners. And so there were six areas that I came up with. Um, and I'm going to be speaking, hopefully, at the lead um, presentation that's in uh, April in the greater uh, Seattle area. And I will explain all of these, but I'll just give you the teaser, which is the, the six topics that fall within the core values. And that is excellence, respect, integrity, stewardship, collaboration, and kindness. I so like those. Those are um, fundamental beliefs and guiding principles that dictate behavior. And they will create an unwavering guide and pathway to fulfilling your goals. I have found that sharing this with potential clients, they suddenly have a new attitude toward you. And this is in any of the businesses. If they understand what your basis is, how professional you are, and you can explain to them these six core values and how you're going to integrate them into what you're doing for them, they are so impressed. So it's one of the ways people are always saying, well, how do I get the job? People always undercut me in pricing. Well, so take a different approach. Share your core values and tell, you, tell them how you're going to serve them. And that's way more impressive. Yeah. yeah. It is. And it, and it encompasses everything. And so I was looking at, because um, we have to redo the business planning and goal setting webinar piece. Um, when you look at the triangles, oftentimes it starts with mission, vision, statement, but then I've noticed the core values one, there's some several graphics where that comes on, that's actually on top, and then the mission vision falls under it. And I thought it's interesting because not every business model is teaching that, but that is the most important because that's the whole reason why you're doing what you're doing and it does filter into everything else. What are your core values? Yeah. Yeah. So when I when I chose I had to choose a logo for my new blueprint for staging, and it's just a six-sided blue. Um, hexagon, because there are six core values, and without the six sides of the core values, then you don't get anything else. You are so smart. <laughs> so what else? So how? So how has it been? Uh, so you sold your business. I know people are kind of interested in that too. So you sold your company. How long? How long did it take you? What? How long was that process to accomplish? It took me a little over a year. Um, I was a dinosaur, so I did not have any inventory management system. So I had to go through and um, itemize everything that I owned and then put an um, initial purchase price on it and um, determine 
depending on how old it was, what the current value was. And uh, the person that bought my company was actually uh, the fellow that owned the moving company that I employed. And so he was familiar. We had worked together for three or four years and his sister was looking for a new kind of work. So she is the um, actual trained, IHAS trained stager. And um, it, she came, this was the best part. I worked as a solo stager for like five of my 10 years. And it was always riding in the car alone. You know, the movers would come and drop everything off. And then I would do the setup. The last five months I owned the company, uh, she came with me. And her brother paid her. So I had a free assistant for five months. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Which was just such a blessing because I could take the um, HOV lane. I didn't have to sit in the traffic with everybody else. I had somebody to talk to. And um, it, it was just so much fun getting to know a new young stager. And the one thing that solo <laughs> practitioners miss is they don't get input from another creative person while they're working. And that's um, invaluable. You just, if you can at all em- employ or borrow people to work with you, you'll get so much more out of it. So that's so, that's um, so true. I mean, cause it is to have kind of, it's either you bounce the ideas off and if you're unsure about something, they might come in, it could just be a slight tweak or just an adjustment or maybe moving something from one room to another and, and it just comes together in a different way. And, um, and it is more fun. I mean, I, I started off as a solo as well. And then um, my first person I had worked with me was a friend. She came on as an assistant cause she wanted to make some extra money. And so back then I paid her out of my, um, my income from the client, which I wouldn't do that. I would have built it in. Like if I was, I was making $75 an hour back then as for staging, this is 2003. And so instead of, tacking on her 10 or 15 bucks to make it 90 to the client. I took it out of mine. So I made less. And so, um, but eventually she wanted to do more staging. So she went and took a class and got her ASP. And, uh, but it was always more fun to have somebody else there because you're right. not only for the um, logistical side and making sure it looks to pull together, but it is just the camaraderie. Yeah, absolutely. So um I also wanted to let folks know that um, I am doing a presentation for the Boston IHOSP chapter um, next week, and I will be talking on um, statistics, taxes, and everything numbers. So if you're not a member of um, uh, one of the chapters, you can try out different chapters uh, once or twice for free. And if you'd want to see what the Boston chapter is like, here's my little promo. Um, right. That's next Thursday um, at 7 Eastern time. And you can contact um, Maureen Poole. Um, yeah, so for more the Boston... And they have you, so you can remote in. So they they are they do accept remote members, don't they? I believe yes, they do. They do. So so people who aren't in the Boston area, you can still tap into this meeting that Edie will be the featured speaker on and get the information. And uh, one of the reasons we started remote chapters, which people can remote in through Zoom, conference call on a cell phone, having it out. Um, it doesn't have to be complicated technology, but that way anybody anywhere um, who's an IHOS member, you can participate in with your colleagues and learn good information and just stay, you know, stay connected, which is really important. Um, the fast lead workshop in Seattle is on the 24th. So those of uh, you that April. are watching this, yes, April 24th is not March. <laughs> it's, it's the 25th. Oh, you're right. It's Friday. Whatever that Friday is. I, have it down here I know we changed it the 25th. Got to get my dates right here. 25th. Okay. I just changed it. Yes. Okay. It is Friday the 25th in Seattle. Um, Joanne Lennon Weary will be there. Trisha Tomlinson, so the Staging Design Network, they're going to be part of this actually being held at their facility. Um, Edie will be speaking, and, um, and we'll have a couple other, you know, key people that will be sharing on um, the financial and the marketing piece. And so, you know, again, those of you stagers that are out there and you're like, you know, I need help. I need to know how to be successful in my business. These these sessions are for you. I mean, um, 
They're being held all over the place. We have one in Fort Lauderdale that's now June 4th because we had it in March and it's the spring market. There's really crazy. So Sandra suggested we move and give us, give us um, a time of year that's not so hectic. So Fort Lauderdale, June 4th. Um, Boston is April 9th. Seattle is April 25th. Um, uh, let's see what else do we have on here. We have Houston. Houston is um, April 14th, I believe. Uh, sorry, I should have these um, fast lead. Uh, it's under Mary Scally. I'm, I'm I'm looking at a spreadsheet. Very so next week I'll have this <laughs> more organized. <laughs> yeah. uh, more I'll have it on the list printed. Um, May first is supposed to be the fast lead in Long Beach, Sacramento. Um, the fast lead is April twenty fourth, um, and I'll be there. So Kevin Tain is teaching in Sacramento, and I will be there at the fast lead in Sacramento, um, as well as other people. So. Those of you that are watching, if you need help with your business, whether you're beginner, intermediate, or advanced, these topic areas here, there's always something we can learn to be better um, with our business. Please register. There's there's discounts too, or pre preferred promotional incentives to help you save some money. Um, uh, Two seventy five, I believe, is the regular price. It's a full day of education, um, and then lunch is provided. We have sponsors. Sharon Williams um, is sponsoring in Boston, so you know they're going to talk about color. Um, so don't wait to get your tickets because if we don't have the numbers that we need, we then are going to pull the plug. And it's not going to be the day before because I'm not going to tie up people's time. It'll probably be the week before any of these happen. If we don't have the numbers that we need, then um, we will just reschedule or postpone them. And, you know, we started doing the fast lead. I came up with these because of people sharing. I need information on this. I'm, I'm struggling with that. They, they want the information. And we sent out a survey um, to the industry and the feedback was, oh, yes, you know, we definitely need this, we'll attend. And so um, I'm just imploring everybody to please register so these people that are committing their time and expertise for you guys are uh, for the industry and anybody again can join. It's not, doesn't have to be an IHAS member or association member of any kind. It's just you're in the home staging industry and you want to learn. Come and be part of that. And I know that, you know, I could schedule staging projects over every single one of these dates. Um, you know, because we have a productive business. However, I block the time off because it's important to um, advance my business and learn. And as great as social media is, these different chat groups and so forth, and our you know, home teaching professionals page and group, um, there's something to be said for sitting and actually learning and having tangible information and things you can action items you can actually take away right then and utilize versus writing online. How do you, what do you price for consultation? Or um, I need a spreadsheet to organize my this or what social media do you like to use? And you're just asking your colleagues information versus this is actually bringing experts to the audience. So um, anyway, I mean, I'm, I'm hopefully, well, Seattle, um, what's happening in Seattle? Are they making people stay home or what's the status? Uh, they announced today that the governor is banning any gatherings of 250 people or more for the near future. It's not just for two weeks, it's for the near future. And, and they said, if that doesn't help reduce it, then it's gonna go down to people, 50 people or more. And if that doesn't work, then they're going to, there's um, not allowing any um, people into any of the different sports venues now. There will be no fans, all of the, uh, the Sounders who are the um, rugby team, uh, football team, the um, soccer team, none of them can have any, uh, anyone but the participants in there. You know, I, I think about the impact, you know, you start thinking the snowball of, of a decision like that because you have the ticket sales for the venue. So there's, you know, even, even like the airlines right now, I mean, they're saying, you know, globally, everybody, there's a, there's a huge fiscal impact on, on this. And so I'm hoping that they get it under control sooner than later. Um, yeah. The, my husband's in the medical field. It will be under control once they get um, a vaccine and that's not expected for a year and a half. So it's not going to be as bad as it is now, but it's not, just going away in a couple of weeks. Um, so we are changing our uh, travel patterns. We are not we are not traveling outside of the country. We are not traveling long distances. He's a, he's a cancer specialist. If we went to Portugal and had to be isolated for two or three weeks, not only would that be harmful for us, 
but they don't have replacements for three weeks for the cancer patients. So, you know, if, if you're in private business, you need to look at what the possibility of the outcome could be. Plus, I live 10 miles from the nursing home, which is like the epicenter in this area. And they're not going to want people from Seattle just coming to hang out because it's community um, contagion now. It, it's being transmitted through non, uh, just ways they can't predict. So um, we just don't know what's going to what's going to be next. So, are you, so am I hearing you're not going to go to Portugal? We're we're hoping we can. If, okay. If uh, I'm, things I'm settle paid, down, I've paid for everything. Right. <laughs> I mean, I have. And we need you there speaking. I mean, it might end up being a. I mean, I don't, and that's the whole thing too. It's like these conferences people are, you know, planning, and you have to move forward your life as if things are going to be okay. But it's, um, it is, it is, uh, you know, definitely challenging. Um, I, Sonia said, you know, Italy obviously has, I think, the largest outbreak in Europe, but they were not ground zero. Um, she wrote to me yesterday. She said it was actually somebody from Germany who was patient zero for the entire year EU breakout, and um, and so Italy's gotten this bad. <laughs> this bad rap, like they're the ones that are contaminating everybody, but they weren't even the ones that brought it in. So, um, and, and the reason the numbers are so high there is that Italy's healthcare is free. So everybody went to get tested and they have accurate numbers. The numbers here are probably phenomenally high, but they don't have the testing because they're testing all the nursing homes and not, not everybody else, but they've closed all the schools. They've closed the universities. Um, they're advising, Crazy. you know, all of the big tech companies have people working from home. Um, Thankfully, they can do, you know. Yeah. And all of the companies who have hourly workers, they've agreed to pay them because um, they can't be responsible for that many people going out of work. And they're trying to figure out ways to make this work. So it, it the freeways, the highways that I complained about for 10 years are barren. Um, Pike's Place Market, where everybody sees the guys throwing the fish. Right. Tumbleweeds, crickets, there's nobody there. So I think about the impact of those people that rely on consumers to come to them. It's going to be, um, it's going to be hard. I don't know if there's any kind of like government support to help these people through because it's to the none, none of their doing that this happened. But so right. Seattle's probably the largest. They said New York actually has the most um, cases, but I thought Seattle um, did. Denver, well, we only have, I think, eight. Denver, you have eight. Okay, we've uh -huh. got 23 dead. And um, in the thousands of people, as many as they've tested, the predominance have been positive. The one big thing they're worried about now is the cruise ship season starts April the 1st. Every the federal industries. Every cruise ship that comes into the port of Seattle brings $4 million to the city in, wow. a, in a day. And um, the cruise companies, if you don't have people getting on the boat, they're not going to come to Seattle. So it'll be anyway. an interesting situation. Yeah, and I wonder, I mean, people can be, maybe they can pre-screen people. I don't know, but that whole, besides the, even with this virus, there was also the, the constant outbreak of, you know, uh, food, contamination oh. in the food and all that. So the cruise ships have had had real, a lot of really bad press the last couple of years. So this does not help that at all. No, no. And all of the support people that support yeah. the cruise industry. And we have Boeing here, support the airplane industry. Right. You know, it's like a, a double whammy. So I think we'll just have to wait and see. Um, none of us have control over this. I think that things in some respects aren't as bad as the media is playing it. And in some yeah, respects, I think so too. And in some respects are way worse than anyone is admitting. So we'll just. Right. I mean, Sonia out. said that yeah. the government said it was just sort of like the flu. They really weren't prepared and that's why it spread. But it's, you know, Italy in general, they're very, I mean, there's 68 million people, I believe, in Italy. I remember looking that up when we went to Rome because I thought, you know, smaller than California is so what's the population. So I guessed. And then I was shocked when I really realized that it's a huge, it's very dense. So I think that's also an issue. Um, uh, and it's interesting that it's not targeting younger people, 40 and under. Um, it's the 40 and over that it's, they, they don't understand why the, you know, babies and younger people aren't really getting impacted. So 
Um, so, you know, we are kind of in a wait and see pattern and hoping for the best. Um, I don't, I'm kind of in the mindset that I can't stop my life. So I'm not going to live in a, in fear, but take precautions, be smart when you go out, um, you know, don't shake people's hands and do different, you know, be just take precautions. And, um, and then we just hope that I'm, I'm hoping they get a, a vaccine sooner than that, but we'll see. I mean, the flu is also out there. The flu kills, the regular flu kills more people. So this one is just more aggressive and it's mutating. Right. And right. The flu becomes more dormant when the weather gets warmer. They don't mm-hmm. know if the COVID-19 is going to act the same way just because we're hoping we're related. They don't at this point. No, they're going to have to wait until summer to really know. I was able to think it was a bioengineered, um, bioengineered on purpose uh, virus. That's what some people are saying, like the kind of the conspiracy things, because it came out of, um, you know, obviously China. And um, so I don't know. I mean, there's, it's interesting to see when I read, like some people are really on the conspiracy side, like a ho- the, ho- the um, hotel that collapsed with all the people inside. How did that happen? And so there's a lot of that kind of, um, you know, you really don't know what's going on. So um, anyway, interesting times. So that's why this is being able to do things like this and educate online. I mean, you know, maybe we have virtual conference or something like that if, if it comes down to, um, because education is important no matter what. And thank goodness for technology, right? Yes. It allows us to be able to see each other and, and experience something, even if we're not personally there. So, um, well, I'm excited for your new company. And I know that you, you hopefully are planning to be in Denver um, as a, a vendor and speaker, most likely. Um, I know that you turned something in and I have to go through all the uh, speaker requests and people are asking. So Kathy Fouth, if you're watching, I, I have seen everything. I just haven't put plug people in where they need to go yet. So I haven't made any decisions on speakers uh, for the breakouts, but um, we have, you know, good lineup and yours are so um, informative and knowledgeable. And I love that you like sharing with other people to help them as well, because not everybody takes the time to do that. So thank you. Um, I guess that's it for our show for today. We're at almost 1030. Um, Next week we will have, I'm going to quickly look at my calendar here, another great show and um, oops, March 18th. I believe I have Mary, uh, Mary Scally will be joining us and um, for uh, home staging talk show live. And then in, I think the week after that, we'll have Chris Widener on who's one of our keynotes. And so we've got a great lineup coming up for everybody. So check out, blueprintforstaging.com. That's how you can find Edie or Edie, E-D-I at blueprintforstaging.com. That's how you can reach her via email. Um, of course, Robbie, uh, Robbie um, unites.com. You can find him there and um, get connected. And then again, share the segment out. You guys weren't very chatty with me. So make sure you always comment and uh, let us know you're watching. We appreciate our audience. Appreciate you all taking the time to tune in. So we'll see you next week for another great segment. Thanks, Bye-bye. Edie. Love Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Well, bye, everybody. We'll see you next week for another great segment. Have a great rest of your week, rest of your Wednesday. Hashtag um, stage, stage your Wednesday. Don't forget to put that up again. Stage your Wednesday and raise the standards. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Bye.